Happy Easter, you guys. How you guys doing? Happy Resurrection Sunday. Easter or Resurrection Sunday is tied for my favorite holiday in the world, right? Uh, obviously, we love Christmas, but if you think about it, uh, Christmas would not be significant if it wasn't for Easter. It would just been another baby born, which many of them are born every single day. That would have been special to certain people. But the fact that this baby got up out of the tomb on the third day and resurrected the highest place in the universe makes this day so special. You know, I was just thinking about it, and I read this thing online that I actually said first service, a billion people. They say close to two billion people on the planet right now are celebrating what you and I are celebrating. And that's what makes this day so special because Easter answers life's deepest question and solves life's most difficult problem. And that's why this day is so special. That's why this service is so special. And how many of you know, Easter is so much more. I'm all for the kids, man. Let's celebrate. Let's help them understand. But it's so much. No, no. These kids are amazing. Oh, really? I was going about another group of kids. But come on. Those kids were amazing, right? They, that, that was just that was incredible. Matt, you and the worship team, I love the life they brought. I just want to stop and just let you know, a lot of times on Easter, people kind of do, and, and I believe it all glorifies God, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm not taking a, you know, I'm not taking a strike. But sometimes it could be so programmed, so performance, that I think we miss really who we're singing about, right? It's like you can do the right things but miss the right one. But I'm, you know, we aimed it at the right one this morning, Jesus, and it was profound. Come on, so they did a good job. Y'all agree with me on that? Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, for many people, many people we know, Easter is about coloring some eggs and hiding it in the grass, right? It is about getting new outfits, and that's all cool, get a new outfit. That's cool, new reason to do some retail therapy, right? For other people, it's about getting all different kind of candy. And, hey, I'm not mad at you. I love me some Reese's, them little chocolate, peanut butter eggs. They are fire. So I just want you to know I love them. But I'm even know Easter is a whole lot more than that. It isn't about a bunny. Come on, somebody, right? Uh, bunnies don't lay eggs. And what they do lay, lay you don't want to gather in a basket, okay? <laughs> just, just trying to keep it real with you. I said this first service, and I'm going to say this. I don't know why I'm saying it. I'm thinking about Easter, but I'm thinking, for the record, my vote for the nastiest, worst piece of confectionery concoction ever made, it beats Christmas date fruitcakes. It is. You ready for this? The yellow marshmallow bunny. I don't even know what that stuff is. It tastes nasty. If you get that, peeps, peeps. That's what it's called? It's called peeps. If your peeps give that to you, they not your peeps. That's all I'm saying, all right? That stuff's nasty. But seriously, this day has so much more meaning, and I think I want to break into that. So I think they're going to help me. I'm going to open up a passage here. We're going to go to John chapter 20. I'm going to read two verses in the beginning, and then I'm going to jump down to verse 11 so we're not reading a super long passage but I really want to talk to you about the importance of this day. I'm talking to you about this thought about having a merry moment. It says in verse 1, John 20, it says, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, in your mind, underline that. Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, began in the dark. This is important here. It says, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, and she found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other Disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, that would be John, and that's who's writing this passage right here. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. Now jump down to verse 11. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. In one chapter, she is listed and references crying four different times. This is a very dark moment, literally and metaphorically, for Mary. It says, and she wept and stopped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have, this is Mary's response, because they have taken away my Lord, she replies, and I do not know where they have put him. 
She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? So second time she's being asked this, Jesus asked her, what are you looking for? Uh, excuse me, who are you looking for? Because I'm, I'm going to cite that a little bit later. She thought he was a gardener, sir, she said. If you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go get him. It's like, you've been cutting hedges and stealing bodies? Like, where is Jesus at? <laughs> Mary, Jesus said, she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which in Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Excuse me, let me say that again. Ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. There we go. I said it right. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. You know, I grew up in Oakland, California. And I love to tell Californians I grew up in Oakland, California, because you know that as I've traveled, there are Oaklands in a lot of places. There's Oakland, Maine. There's Oakland, Portland. There's Oakland, Michigan. But Oakland, California is a unique Oakland. No disrespect to those other Oaklands. I grew up in a place that uh, there was gangs. Uh, there was violence. Uh, it was not uncommon where I grew up. I grew up uh, two blocks from the West MacArthur BART station. Anyone familiar with Oakland? Uh, in West Oakland. And there was a I, my apartment complex was right at the intersection of an overpass and an alleyway, which made it prime geographic territory for gang activity. There were guns going off. There were sirens. There were screams. And I, I kind of got used to it. And I'm, I'm speaking to this thing that Easter began in a dark place. This is early in the morning while it was still dark. I recognize something that there could be a lot of people with a lot of different stories and I'm not trying to compare I always here as much to let you understand something about my own upbringing my wife Krista which I should have introduced her my beautiful wife Krista so love her she's amazing she was on staff here one of the reasons why I love the house is she was here and then my daughter Brittany is right here too Love her. And my son, Brandon, has been a youth pastor, and I think he spoke a couple times. Brandon Smith has spoken a couple times. So I have a reason to love this house in a big way. My wife's from Oregon, and I, I have this kind of thought. I insist upon it. I don't think there are two states in this entire union of the United States of America that share a border that are more diametrically different than California and Oregon, right? They want to know that the, a, the, the chicken was range-free, could run around, was unharmed, and all that kind of stuff. And I just want to know, is it baked? Is it chicken? Is it barbecued? Is it fried? You know, it's like, uh, but when I first stayed the night up in Oregon, it was so quiet, I couldn't sleep. It scared me. <laughs> I heard animals out there, and I'm like, what are they planning right now? Because this, this doesn't sound good. This, that's not like a GNU, whatever a GNU is. It might be in heat. I don't know what's going on, right? I need some gunfire, I need some sirens, I need somebody screaming, and this is how I grew up. And the darkness shifted, but first it had to land. That sounds crazy. I was nine years of age, I'm in a, a backwoods city, if you would call it, a country town in Oklahoma called Ardmore, Oklahoma. Uh, right here, if this was the church it was at, there would be a coffin, it would be an open coffin, it would be my dad. Nine years of age, I'm sitting in the front row, and I'm, I, I, don't, I don't recommend this. If you have a nine-year-old kid, you probably, I was, <laughs> I had the worst nightmares for the longest time. But I'm looking at my dad, and it's a strange thought for a fourth grader, is I thought, that should not be my dad in that coffin. That should be me in that coffin, because he had so much to live for, and I obviously probably don't at this point. And so my life turned very dark. My grandmother raised me, and I'm only going to give you a bit more of my story She's four decades into being an alcoholic, a functioning alcoholic. I believe she loved me with everything she could. She had her own issues and own problems. And her, my step-grandfather, he was an alcoholic, he was abusive to her. And so she kind of came up in the midst of that. But fast forward, I'm a junior in high school. And as I'm a junior in high school, my grandmother, she goes to Safeway Supermarket. Thank God for Safeway Supermarket. She meets some ladies there that invite her to their storefront church. Probably wasn't that big, right? Maybe maybe, I don't know, a fifth, maybe a tenth of we're in this room. I thank God for small little storefront churches, not all mega churches. Like everything don't happen in mega churches. God still uses some storefront. My grandma's at this storefront Pentecostal holiness 
church. They shared the gospel message. My grandmother walks forward. She gives her life to Christ. She's crying. Remember, Mary's weeping, right? My grandmother's weeping. She's getting set free, you guys, set free. She hops back on the bus, goes all the way back from Lake Merritt all the way into West Oakland. She walked up in our apartment, goes over to this cabinet, breaks all our alcohol bottles. I'm coming home from basketball practice about this time. I'm seeing her break all these alcohol bottles. And don't get me wrong, I wanted to see her free. I just thought this, this seems like it's coming too easy. You're going to have a relapse. This addiction is going to come back. You know, I'm thinking all of this in my head. I'm thinking you need to go to Betty Ford Chill Out Centers and have successive reduction from the undesirable substance and substitute something else. And grandmother was already prophetic, meaning she could hear the voice of God. She looked at me. She said, baby, grandma don't need to take 12 strap. Grandma just need to take one. I gave my life to Jesus. He set me free. That, that was my message. And it was like in that moment, I saw up close and personal my grandmother's Mary, M-A-R-Y, moment, and it would lead to mine. The reason why this thing, Mary, moment is so important is found in this passage. But first, let me tell you this. When I was a kid growing up in Oakland, right, you ready for this? I wanted to be two things, an astronaut and a pirate. <laughs> True. I think there's a concurrent theme in it. There, it was about escape. I was trying to escape. Like, what was going to get, put me on the seas, put me in space. And I think because of Captain Crunch, I think pirates won out. So I was more like Captain Jack Sparrow than Captain Neil Armstrong, okay, for the record. But why? I recently came to this knowledge. You know why uh, pirates wear a patch over their eye. I thought maybe they were in battle and somebody gouged out their eye and the poor pirate, they don't have no eye there. And so you want to cover it up so it don't look too bad. That's actually not the case. Like, I, maybe there were some pirates like that, but this is why they did. You're ready for this. Is that many of these pirates would stand on the top of the boat, the deck, and they would look into the horizon and they would see because pirates are trying to hit up somebody, right? They're trying to do a sail by, okay, right? And so they're looking out the... the <laughs> The, I love this group. They're laughing at my jokes, y'all. My daughter just shakes her head. But what happens is if another pirate ship came to bum rush them, like, like gangs about to collide, they would have to run into the cargo hold and get their weaponry. But we've all experienced this. If you go from extreme bright to extreme darkness, you're blinded for a season. Your eyes are trying to adjust to the dark. Well, they didn't have the luxury and, and probably most 18th century sailors didn't. So you left an eye in the dark. So it was used to the dark. Oh, come on. Somebody help me preach this thing. So when you're ready to fight, right, you just flip that thing up. Now my eyes are adjusted. I can get my sword and I'm ready to go, right? We all see the brilliance as these pirates would see the brilliance of the horizon. We all see the brilliance of the resurrection. But to understand Mary, you have to put the patch on and understand it began in the dark. She didn't see the conclusion until the conclusion happened, right? Like, she didn't see the breakthrough until the breakthrough came. She doesn't have, let me, I got to do a better job. In Bangladesh, they were showing the Jesus film. Bill Bright, Vanetta, Vanette Bright, founders of Campus Crusade for Christ. They did this Jesus film. Billions of people have seen it, and many, many, many people have come to Christ. They're showing this in Bangladesh, one of the early times in, in a particular area where it was very much evangelistic. It was, it was virgin territory. As they're doing it, most of the adults would stand in the back, and all the kids were up front. And at a certain point, they're getting to the crucifixion, and they're getting to the flogging and all the things of Jesus and, and, and the price he paid for us. And all of a sudden, you can hear gasps. You can hear audible cries. People are flat out losing it. And all of a sudden, one little kid got up and said, y'all don't have to cry. He gets up again. I saw the movie before, right? <laughs> he had to patch off the eye. You got to patch off the eye. We know the end of the story. He gets back up out of the tomb again. But for Mary, she doesn't see that, right? So stick with me. Let me uh, kind of give you a recap. I call it this kind of recap. Here is Resurrection Morning Recap. If we piece together the various accounts of Easter Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead at some point in pre-dawn. Somebody say pre-dawn. There's an earthquake. The seal is broken. The stone is rolled away. Angels are sitting on top of the stone talking to folks. 
soldiers who were guarding the stone, they get knocked out, and when they come to, they scream in terror and take off running, right? And when the woman found the tomb empty, they were confused and terrified. They went to tell the disciples, but Mary Magdalene, she was, many of the scholars would tell us, she was the last at the cross and the first to the tomb because she loved Jesus like that because Bible would tell us she was delivered of seven demons by Jesus. You imagine how bound one devil could have a person? We're not talking we, seven times. Let's see, I don't know. She had three different addictions. She had two different abuses, an abusive relationship. That's five. She had schizophrenia. She had, I, I don't know. She, there were seven different things, and Jesus sets her free and loved her right where she was. That she took everything she had and sacrificed at his feet. She became an instant follower. So imagine the devastation of why a woman within one chapter would be recounted as weeping four different times. This was the man that set her free. This was the man, the God man, that gave her hope. Easter has got to mean so much more. This is what I felt for me. I, maybe I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to me. I'm on the southwest plane flying out of Oakland to, to Burbank yesterday, and then I'm just praying for this moment with you guys, and I felt like the Lord just reminded me that has, has Easter marked you in a way that every single Easter is just as fresh as the first Easter? And I feel like it's a challenge to me. And I, and I was, if I have to be honest, I have to say, maybe not, Lord, but I, I believe that you spoke that to me because you want it to be. So I need you to mark me. I'm, my prayer, right, even as I speak right now, is that God would mark you with the encounter of Easter. I could very easily be talking to people that you love the Lord or some maybe you've there's periods of time when you were closer to the Lord than you are now, or maybe some that you're just seeking and you're ready to take that next step on your journey, or some you're still evaluating. But I'm telling you right now, all it takes is one merry moment, and the whole script is flipped. So before we get any further, I just, Lord, I pray, God, right now, that wherever we're at, that, Lord, you would meet us with this merry moment Easter encounter where, God, you step off the pages and, and ideas of ceremonies and religious talks and that, God, you become so real to us. So I pray, God, you would do that even now in the name of Jesus. Here is Mary. She's at the tomb. She's confused. She's bewildered. She's in shock. She's frightened. She's brokenhearted. And it didn't occur to her that the empty tomb meant a risen Savior. We celebrate the empty tomb. I've been to the empty tomb, or at least most of the people would say we're 90% sure this is, you go to the Holy Land, you'll get that terminology and that joke. Unless it's by a body of water or a mountain or something, they have to estimate, but most of them would go history, tradition, yep, 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 90%. The empty tomb, I jumped up and down and celebrated, but you got to understand, she had a whole different response. She is weeping, why? Because she's coming to the tomb after seeing two days earlier the most brutalizing death she had ever seen. And she's coming to anoint his body with some spices. We were just talking to a friend of mine, great friend of mine, one of my closest friends, just recently lost his dad. We had sent flowers. The tradition of sending flowers to people to kind of, uh, kind of let you know you're with them in their bereavement and to honor the dead really they would say, has its origin in spices. But spices, nor were the original flowers. The spices or flowers originally wasn't there just to honor the dead. It was there to fight off the odor of death. How many of you know there's still something inside of us that wants to fight off death? <laughs> Let me give you this, okay? I'm a bit of an MCU dude, right? I, I would be a middle, my son is done, I'm jealous of him. I would be a middle-aged black man going down to Comic-Con in San Diego, full-blown, you know, Wakanda forever or whatever. I'd put on all, I got, I got some of that stuff on my desk right now as we speak, right? There's this guy that I, I follow his YouTube channel. I, I can't vouch for everything he says or anything like that, but it's called Emergency Awesome. His name's Charlie. He breaks down MCU and other movies, Disney Plus stuff, but he, he, his specialty is Easter eggs. Come on, we're on Easter. Now, don't think of the colored eggs. I got some help. Here is the Easter egg. An Easter egg, in terms of the terminology of how it's used today, follow me. It's a message, image, 
or feature hidden in a video game film or other electronic medium. It is a sneaky little message that's hidden in your favorite film that makes you love to spot it and go, ah, oh, clever. I want to give you some Easter eggs out of this passage. And so here is kind of the first one. It says again in verse 1, early in the morning, on a Sunday morning while it was still dark. This is a vivid description of how many people live and feel today. They feel that there's a darkness that's covering them. They feel like they're living in darkness. We live in a world full of bad stuff. I don't even have to preach on that, right? I mean, wars, right, that's going on right now. Divisions, many other evils that are taking place. The exploitation of kids, exploitation of women. People being murdered for their Jordans, ATM cash, or designer bags. Come on, somebody. They got this whole smash and grab thing that literally in San Francisco has gone crazy. The only in and out that I'm aware of in Oakland. I read an article. They shut it down because there was too many people shooting and robbing folks in and out, right? So people was going in, but before they went out, they got robbed, right? In and robbed and out. <laughs> and most of the root cause of this darkness and chaos is not political. So I'm going to venture to rub the cat the wrong way and tell you, although we're in election year, it... it <laughs> The problem is not political, so the solution would not be political. I'm just here to tell you, I, I vote, vote responsibly, vote biblically, all that stuff. But I'm here to tell you, if you think somebody in office can deal with the darkness, not just, I, I'm not even talking about the darkness in here. They certainly can't legislate that out. That's not going to be educated, legislated, or voted out. There's only one answer to the darkness, and the first Easter egg is Mary would find out the only way to stop the weeping was to discover the joy in someone that it resurrected from the dead. Oh, uh, y'all helping me now. Why was she sad they had taken her love away? And then all of a sudden, she has this patch. Here is what I believe about darkness. There's so many other things we could talk about the days we live in, the hopeless, the, the despair, the anxiety medications that, that pharmaceuticals are making hand over their fist, dollars, the disappointment, the breakups, the challenges of family and relationships. But here is the truth I want to give you. When you close your eyes to the light of the world, darkness is the end result. The darkness, Easter began in darkness, but what I'm telling you, the end result is if you can't see the light of the world, capital L light, that would be Jesus, the end result is darkness. And that can be a cultural, atmospheric thing, but I'm saying on an individual basis, it becomes the darkness you find and the inescapable kind of this chaos and frustration and, and, and all these things. So the women are there, they're spicing up, and here is Mary. She goes to the tomb. We would go to the tomb. I would think, I think there are great people of faith in this room. I would think when you go, went to the empty tomb, you'd be jumping up and down and say, Jesus told us he would do it. But I wonder if sometimes the grief and the pain, she had saw a brutal death, that sometimes the pain of our lives keeps us from seeing the joy and the hope that's being offered to us. That the empty tomb that makes us shout, we just did it, then we said, we sang the song, and y'all shouted. Y'all shouted big time. The empty tomb that makes us shout, shout made her cry because, follow me. When she saw the empty tomb, her first thought wasn't resurrection. Her first thought was there's a grave robber on the loose. And yet she's going to be the church's first evangelist. She was told to go tell the others. You know what, fam? Mary couldn't find God. Another Easter egg. And I wonder how many of us are struggling to find God. Maybe because of a circumstance that happened. I, I, I clearly remembered. By the time my dad had been murdered, uh, he was murdered by a policeman and he proved in court he had did no crime. It, it was proven in court it was racially motivated. Before there was a George Floyd, John Henry Smith Jr. was that in his day and age. There's still, I did some research, you can still find articles on it and there was a, a bit of a movement. Again, I honor men and women in blue. This is not one of those things where I'm going, I, I have great friends and relatives, and, and a relative that's given his life on police force. So I have honor, but these guys didn't honor the badge. And so in the midst of that, I felt this overwhelming thing of, God, you must not really like me to allow my life to look like this. And all of a sudden, I had a merry, my grandma had a merry moment, then I would have my merry moment. I'm going to get into that in just a minute. But here she is, weeping over an empty tomb, but this is what it tells me. 
Mary's encounter with the empty tomb isn't what changed her, right? We preach about the empty tomb, and I love that, and I love it. But the more I was thinking about it, it isn't the empty tomb. The, the evidence of that is available for everyone, but not everybody changes on that because here's what I'm saying. The evidence alone will not persuade you. It helps that the tomb is empty. It helps that there were people that literally tried to drum up some sort of theory and some sort of, at that time, lie that they stole it. Well, there was no way them decided. First of all, they said that it would take 60 men to roll a stone away. Uh, Judas had already bounced, right? And, uh, and so did many. Uh, Peter is still denying Jesus three times in front of campfire girl. I mean, it was going to be Mary, Mary, Mary. And John trying to roll, it, it's not going to happen. And then you got soldiers in front of them. But here's what I'm saying. Evidence alone will not persuade you, but follow me. Evidence with an open heart leads to a merry moment. And my challenge, anytime that I get a chance to share this glorious thing that Jesus has done, is I could present to you evidence, but if your heart isn't open, right, you leave no room to have a merry moment. My job And I want to say this right. My job is not to win you, right? The Bible says he who wins souls is wise, but there's only one that's wise, the Holy Spirit. My job is to lead you to an encounter to one who could win your affections, win your allegiance, and win your mind. But it only happens if you have an open heart when presented with the truths of these things that we're talking about. Mary had all the right facts, but she still jumped to the wrong conclusion. So much so, somebody say so much so. Two angels, one of the translations said they're in dazzling apparel, white. They go, girl, why are you weeping? That's the Sean Smith, Rick James <laughs> translation. Not King James. <laughs> I went old school. I broke out Rick James on you. Come on, somebody. In the midst of all of it, she still jumps to the wrong wrong conclusion because what? Crisis. In crisis, we lose ourselves. And so she has angels. You would think if an angel shows up in your room tonight, that would be all that would be necessary. (laughs) Right? Hey, say less. Right? I mean, (laughs) I'm with you, bro. I'm with you and Jesus. Right? Here is angels speaking to her, and they ask her, why are you crying? That should have been enough to pull her out and go, if angels are here, Jesus must have risen. How many times are supernatural encounters and things intersect in your life that the only explanation could be God and how much he loves you, and yet we still discount or still doubt that God is really there for us or that something's wrong, I took a wrong way, God doesn't forgive me, he doesn't love me. And the fact is, you got angels around. You are intersecting angels talking about, man, this is a dark season. I get it, but what does it tell me? Christian faith isn't about faith in an event. Christian faith is about trust in a person. What an empty tomb that was going to get her. She encountered an empty tomb. That's not going to get it. It's not. So my question is, what are you looking for? Mary was so focused, another Easter egg, she was so focused on finding a thing, a dead body, so I could anoint it. I could, they disrespected my Savior. The least I could do is anoint him, put some perfume, some spices, so he smells good, honor him in his death. She's looking for something when she should have been looking for someone, right? Because Jesus would later ask her, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I'll come back. He says, who are you looking for? That's the problem, Mary. She wasn't looking for who. She's looking for what? She's looking for CSI corpse. What she's looking for, she needs to be looking for Jesus Christ resurrected out of the tomb. And when he talks to her, she doesn't even recognize him then. I, I debate some of his context. You ever watch any of the iterations of Superman and wonder, how does this putting on some glasses like I don't see you. I don't know who you are. You're bungling Clark Kent. Like, you're about 6'4". You got some muscles on you. You you like, the little little thing is combed back, but you're Superman. I see that. Right? They flip that thing back. I'm Clark Kent. I got glasses on. You know what it is? It's context. All of us have walked up on people and go, I know you. I know you. In the moment they tell you where job, ah, oh, you know who you are. Because you recognize people in context. She wasn't used to seeing Jesus at tombs. Oh. Some of us, we're not, whoa, I almost fell right there. That would be nasty. Thank you, Jesus. There was an angel right there holding me up. 
Some of us are not used to seeing Jesus in the valleys of our life. We're used to seeing him in the, in the mountaintops. Some of us are not used to us seeing Jesus on a Monday morning. We're used to seeing him on a Sunday morning. We're not used to seeing him on a Monday morning. And the context is you, you're not recognizing. It, this isn't like Clark Kent. This is Superman, whether he got the glasses on or off, whether it's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. He's still Jesus, somebody. He's still there for you. So Jesus said, who are you looking for? She's looking for something. Jesus pointed her to a someone. And let me tell you, I think in one way or another, our entire world has been looking for someone. Listen to it. We're looking for someone who will help hurting humanity. We're looking to some politician who will bring us together in unity. We're looking for some lover who will make our dreams come true and our heart warm again. We're looking for some musician or celebrity or artist who can inspire us and soothe us out of all of our troubles. We're looking for someone who can make sense out of life and answer life's most perplexing questions. And I'm telling you, that someone is merry moment Jesus when you recognize Jesus. Now, let me jump down to this. All right, I'm going to give you a dad joke, all right, right? Can I give you a dad? I'm, I'm a dad. Can I give you a dad joke? All right, the three ministers, and they were just kind of talking, and somebody asked them, kind of an icebreaker question, what would you want said at your funeral, at your eulogy? What would you want said? And so there were three ministers. You got to get it. So the first guy wanted to tell him, I want it said of me, I put God first, I put others second, and I put myself last. And other ministers nodded in affirmation. Second minister said, when asked, what would you want said at your funeral? He says, I want, him said, I want it said that I serve God, I serve my family, and I serve my church well. They got to a third minister. He might have been from Oakland. Okay, just a little, <laughs> little bit of hint there. The third minister was asked, what do you want said at your funeral? And he stopped for a moment, and he said, I want it said at my funeral, look, he's still moving. Okay, I just... <laughs> I'm here to tell you Jesus is still moving, right? He's not dead. He's still moving. That's proof, right? The third minister answered correctly. <laughs> Jesus is moving today. He's moved in history. He's moved in hearts. He's moving in this city, in this region. He's moving across the nations of the world. Record numbers of people. Have been, I know we get a lot of bad news of what's going on, but you got to understand Jesus is still moving. Proof he's not dead is somebody here is no longer doing what they did that was destroying their life. They're now here in church lifting up God, worshiping God, being inspired by the, the children choir and going after God with everything in them. We're here today because Jesus didn't stay dead. He moved. Now, here is the thing. Incognito Jesus. Angels had got finished asking her, why are you crying? And she says, hey, somebody stole my master's body, and I don't know where they put the body. So she stays there, and all of a sudden, Jesus now says, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And she says, hey, somebody stole, you're the gardener? Do you have you seen, you know, like she's trying, and she should, this, this is a clue. Great things in the Bible happen in gardens. If I had more time, I could preach that. So he's in a garden, and now we're beginning to land the plane. As she's there, she's getting ready to give the same answer she's given at least two, three other times. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, Mary, here's the Mary moment. You ready for this? A little bit of research would unearth this. Their common language and the language she would have been speaking to the angels and to the disciples and everybody was Greek because the Romans had taken over and they imposed a Greek language. But the heart of the Hebrew people would have been, the language rather, would have been Aramaic. It was their heart language, their first language, right? It's the language they learned as little babies, their mamas and their daddies were speaking to them, but they were imposed that they had to speak Greek. When she sees Jesus, she goes from the imposed language to a heart language. She says in Aramaic, Rabboni, master, teacher, that seeing Jesus immediately begins to make that heart connection of, of radical affection and love because it's not just some distant savior. Today about Easter is not just about some perfunctory kind of religious obligations that we have to appease to feel better about us and what we would do. And, and, and please don't want to take offense to, uh, to this. But I'm telling you, when you make the heart connection, you're more than a CEO. Let me explain. 
Christmas and Easter only Christians as CEOs, right? There is something when the heart of who Jesus has revealed himself to be connects with your heart. And it's just like her in her moment. She's speaking her heart language. There's his love. But here is what began it all, right? The Bible says that Jesus said, Mary. She's not seeing the angels. She's not even seeing Jesus. But there's something about when your name gets called. And then my final Easter egg, and we're done. The Bible says that when she heard her name, she turned around. Oh, my gosh. I wish I could really preach. I, like, I, 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 the new Wonder Woman does this. When I was a kid, Wonder Woman would spin around and get her clothes on. I just want to <laughs> spin around and my hair come out, and I'm just in the Wonder Woman outfit <laughs> right now. Just There is something that you are empowered to do that when you respond to Jesus come, calling your name, you get the power of a turnaround. This merry moment, and you got to understand the context, is it was a turnaround in the midst of turmoil. Yeah. You. Oh, you, 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 you can't get the magnitude of the power that when you respond to when he calls your name, you can turn around no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're in, no matter what has happened to you, no matter what you've done, no matter how bad you think it is, Jesus can call your name. It's the most powerful, I know I'm screaming, it's the most powerful one-word sermon ever preached. How powerful is that? I've listened to entire podcasts and said, they ain't saying nothing, okay? I've listened to entire diatribes on political pundits saying it. They ain't said nothing. Jesus says one word. And how many of you know, no matter what language you speak, the most important word to you is your name. Jesus says, Mary. And she immediately turns around and recognizes it. And she goes from her purpose is to anoint dead body with spices, to now Jesus gives her a purpose. Go tell the disciples that this Easter morning, I'm back from the dead. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you not only get your turnaround, you get your purpose. You go from bringing spices to make a dead body smell better to now you've been entrusted. This mighty woman of God that I don't think gets enough credit that this woman is the church's first evangelist, right? I mean, we don't know what she looked like, but if we did, I'd have a Mary poster up on my wall. Come on, her, Billy Graham, Reinhard Bonnke, come on, somebody. <laughs> this, this woman got 10, right, disciples hiding to come out and to discover that Jesus, and all of a sudden, these guys are willing to give their life for what they believe because her merry moment led to other people having merry moments. And this is what Easter is all about. If I can get someone to come to the keys, you guys have done so well, man. You guys have stuck with us. In that moment, she heard her name. Her tears ceased. We don't hear another word about her weeping, crying. That one word sermon opened her eyes. All confusion is gone, swept away. Come on, somebody. She turns around. And in that moment of that turnaround, soul-crushing grief goes to the height of the best joy ever. Finish my story. One minute. Because of the ward's monies given because of the unlawful murder of my dad by law enforcement, San Jose, California gave myself and two half just 20,000, 20,000, 20,000. Be a multi-million dollar case today. Uh, that was justice when I was nine years of age. I choose the University of Pacific. During that time, my grandmother, who was writing letters to me, it was before right? Grandma's writing letters to me. She would, when I come home, she cooked great food and she hand me a Bible. She saw my name in it. She said, boy, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Promise me one day you're going to find out you cannot do this thing all on your own. Promise me you'll call in the name of Jesus. My grandmother was smart. What she was saying is all Easter's begin in the dark. You about to have an Easter moment, grandbaby, but it, you're gonna, it's probably going to get dark before it gets bright. My grandmother passes. She loses a battle to cancer. Uh, anybody that, uh, you lose your, your mom, your grandmother. Particularly my grandmother raised me, so she was like my mom. And I, I lost my mom uh, during the COVID year. Uh, it is a lightning bolt of the most unique loneliness strikes your soul 
when the maternal figures that birthed you and nurtured you pass and to know that on this side of eternity, you'll never see them again. I didn't know Jesus, so I bought them out. I mean, I bought them out. I can't even begin to describe. I had pleasures while fraternity. I went to the craziest party club set I could find. I partied so hard. I told first of all, it scared me. Like I was a, I was a bit of part. I was a DJ, right? So I'm always at parties. That's how I was making side. I had a side hustle too. It was DJ. Everybody throw your hands up. Throw your hands up. Work up, work up, work up. You know, back when they really used real turntables and real vinyl records. All right. I'm trying to be OG now. So much easier to scratch when you got that old. Never mind. All right. I go out and I party. I had three prong planned. Two of the prongs were very stupid. I party like I never partied before. Prong one. I'll tell you prong two in a moment. Prong three, I'm going to get up the next morning. I know we've got different ages. I'm going to end my life. I, I, I don't have the thought. I, I have a plan. I'm going to do this because my life is so empty and I, I can't see a way out of this darkness. Not that I hated my life or hated myself. I don't know if I fit the profile maybe in it. It is a permanent, if you allow it in the loosest sense, it's a permanent non-solution to a temporary state and problem that if you just get back up the next day, it's going to get better. It's going to get easier. I mean, maybe that's a word for somebody. Just get back up. Just get through the night. Weeping may endure for a night. Joy comes in the morning. That's a merry moment. She weeping, but girl, you about to have her turn around. The second prong plan is my merry moment. I promised my grandmother I would call on her Jesus. I was a lot of things before I was saved, but if I promised my grandmother something, I was going to do it. That's how she raised me. So in that moment, I said, Jesus, if you're real, I want to experience you. And if you let me experience you, I'll give you everything. Did I think he was going to answer? I'll be totally honest. I thought it was going to be empty. I didn't think, I, I think, I didn't think he was going to answer. But here's what I thought. I thought I'm going to die because I'm going to kill myself the next day. I'm going to go for heaven and I'm going to say, angels, play that YouTube. See, I at least try. See me, that's me. I'm crying out. That's got to count. I didn't know how this thing, I thought it was a merit point system. Maybe I can get some extra points. I'm awakened at 3 o'clock in the morning. I see Jesus in the room like I see you. I'm exaggerating. It would be adequate, valid to say I felt something lift off me. I felt peace. I felt a warmth in my heart. I felt the power and empowered to see a turnaround in my life. All that was true. But I would do a disservice to you and to my God to tell you less than what happened. Jesus like this tomb. I had my mirror. He shows up in the room. People say, what did it look like? Remember, I'm a little Marvel dude, right? <laughs> Before I read Revelations, where John says his eyes are like lightning, his face is like the sun shining. The only thing I could have told you is he looked like the human torch on a fantastic four. And Jesus' words to me, I'll be a father to the fatherless. Oh, y'all not hearing me. If you, if you know my story, a kid that I felt like it's not fair other kids have dads and I don't have a dad. And here is God saying that. He had me. It was my merry moment. In one word, well, I will be a father to the fatherless. Okay, not true. Eight words. Eight words. My life changed. I'm doing what I do now. My computer engineering degree is up on the shelf collecting dust. I do what I do gladly. And when I stepped in ministry, I thought I was taking a vow of poverty. I didn't, I thought I have to, I, I seriously, I wasn't going to work computer engineering at that time. This is what I felt because I needed daytime to reach college students. So I unloaded boxes at UPS at night so I could witness to college students during the day. And lo and behold, God showed up and said, nah, I'll let you pay some bills, son. Right now, God is calling your name. And if you'll come with an open heart, all of these Easter eggs that we see in this passage, if you're genuine, if you recognize that the evidence is presented, but it will mean nothing if your heart isn't open. If you recognize that sometimes that it gets dark like that, but God wants to take the patch off so you have the right perception. The thing that makes believers, people, businessmen, people in the, who are creatives in the industry and otherwise, in my estimation, I have a superpower of observation just in this area, people. There are other things, you know, creative comedians, their observational skills is like legendary ninja style. I'm, I'm a little lower, but I've been around enough to notice it's not money, it's not who is holding their arm, not how popular are the followers or likes on their social media account. The successful, even churches, all boils down to this perspective. If the patch is off, they've proven that if you only have, if you cover one eye, your depth perception is affected. But you lift that off, now you got the right and the left eye at work. You can kind of judge. And I feel like that there's been this kind of thing that is 
blocked our perception and your perspective changes everything. This is what happened to Mary. This is what happens to you. And Jesus said, Mary, would you bow your heads right now? I love it. Easter is what? With your heads bowed and eyes closed. Easter is a demonstration of God that life is essentially spiritual and it's meant to be timeless. You see expiration dates on things, on the carton of milk, on the loaf of bread, on the meat, on the spinach. I love to put spinach in my smoothies, but the spinach gets all wilty and smells stinky real quick. And I'm always checking that expiration date. We're used to seeing expiration date on those perishables. But can I tell you, there's an expiration date stamped on everything around you, whether you see it or not. It's on that Tesla. It's on that house. It's on that career. It's on whatever. Because there's only two things that are eternal, God's word and your spirit. And when the two meet, something eternal is birthed in you. C.S. Lewis, a far greater thinker than I could ever aspire to be, said it best. If you feel in your heart that earth cannot supply If you feel a need in your heart that earth cannot supply, it's proof that heaven must be your home. What he's saying is you're looking for expiration date. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, God set eternity in your heart. Easter is about discovering that deepest longing in your heart is about a God connection. You can get a lot of places with a passport, but you can't get to heaven with whatever resume, whatever accomplishments and all those things. And I just want to be that real because I think there's so much on the line. It's not even if you gave to charities and you were kind of honest and kind of did the best you could. That isn't, isn't it. The, the bottom line is, is only in Christianity at the other end of your confession comes a new life. Only when you respond to your name getting called is there a power of a turnaround and a turn around life, Right? I mean, I want to get a shirt and say, I've been turned, right? Have a scripture on the back and with Mary on it, right? And that's what this moment is about. He wants to turn your sorrows back. He wants to turn that heartache and that unanswerable grief. He wants to turn back the confusion of purpose or identity. He wants to turn back what they said when you were in high school, what mom and daddy didn't tell you as you were growing up. And whatever else it is that you could put in a category, Jesus has the ability to turn around. Sometimes it takes a process. You can be born again in an instant, but to renew your mind and to be healed of things may take a process, but God has proven over and over again, your speaker included, that he's willing to take the time, put in the work, roll up his redemptive sleeves to get the job done. Because as far as Jesus is concerned, you're job number one. If you're here right now, you say, Sean, I'm not right with God. I don't know if I were to die where I'd go. I can't think of a more pertinent, important decision you'll ever make. There are many decisions you're called to make on any given day, and sometimes we get option and choice fatigued. This is one you have to make. And by not making a decision, you probably intends the purposes do make a decision. And here's the thing. Jesus loves you. And that's what would make your separation from God such a tragedy. Because here is the thing that you have to understand, right? Is that in the midst of people thinking, where is God? Where they laid the body? That Jesus walks up on Front Street and comes to your address, knocks on your heart, Revelation 3.20. Because he loves you that much. Don't don't slap that hand back. Receive that hand. I seen it in hoop the other night, and one of our warriors got a or somebody got a technical. I don't think it was one of our Golden State Warriors, but a dude went on the ground and the uh, opposing team went to help him up and a dude pushed him out of the way because the guy didn't want to be helped up. Don't be a guy that would push the hand away. If you're here right now, you say, Sean, pray with me. I want to give my life to Christ. I want to come back to the Lord. I know I've taken a moment, but I it's purposeful. I want you to take a moment for it to come from your heart. I need you to go to the Roboni place and not just the Greek kind of learned language, but a heart connect. If you're right now, say, Sean, pray with me. I need to give my life to Christ. I need to come back to the Lord. I lost Jesus somewhere in the pain of, of, man, the pandemic. I lost Jesus through the intellectual wranglings, and I've been deconstructing ever since. And I believe there's good deconstruction, but it's got to lead to reconstruction, or all you did was take a jackhammer to the foundation of your faith. And you can lose a whole lot in a short amount of time in the day we live in in 2024. If you're here right now, say, Sean, pray with me. I want to give my life to Christ. He loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done. All that matters right now is the decision you make. If you're here right now, you say, Sean, pray with me. I need to give my life to Christ. I need to come back to the Lord or the current activities in my life. I know God's not blessing. I need to surrender. If that's you right now, I want to pray for you. 
On the other side of this confession comes a new life. If that's you, he's calling your name. Here's the power of your turnaround. If you say, Sean, pray with me right now. Slip your hand up right now. Slip it up wherever you're at and say, Sean, pray with me. I need to give my life to the Lord. Yes, 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 yes. Amen. Yes, 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 yes. Awesome. I mean, double digits. Come on. I'm not, I'm not counting, but I am acknowledging. Yes, I see that hand. Awesome. This is amazing, somebody. Would you do this with me right now? If you lifted your hand, I, I'm not going to call you up front. I'm not ashamed of that. Neither should you be. But I do think there's something about standing. When I think about Easter, I can't help. My wife was helping me remind it. We think of Easter about the resurrection, but what about Good Friday? Originally, it was Bad Friday. It was good because someone loved you enough to take a stand for you. And because of that, I think we ought to. So if you lift your hand, would you just stand up right where you're at? I'm not going to ask you to come down or move from where, but just stand up. Hand up, stand up. Wherever you're at, if you lift your hand up, you're not alone. Like I said, there was at least double-digit people in the building. But I just feel like this is so important that you say, anybody else wants to join them? Because this is powerful. This is having a merry moment, right? Awesome, awesome. Can all of us pray together, fam? I, I just want you to know, I didn't do this to put you on a spot like, oh, man, this is embarrassing. No, no, no. I did put you on a spot, but the spot's called blessing. Because Jesus said, blessed are you when you acknowledge me. If you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before the Father. So you just got on a blessing spot of acknowledgement. God's going to acknowledge you at a whole nother level. Let's pray right now. Say this with me. Come on, fam. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess you. Come on, everybody. Lord Jesus, I confess you. It's Lord of my life. I believe in my heart. God raised you from the dead. Lord, I repent. I hear my name. I turn around. I thank you, Jesus, that you love me. You died for me. You got up out the tomb for me. You're here for me now. And I declare this afternoon that I'm a child of God. I have victory over the enemy. And I will serve you all my days in Jesus' name. If you're standing right now, just put your hand on your heart or anyone else that would want to be included. Father, I pray that all these standing and others, I pray you would seal the love of God in our hearts. Rabboni, that's the heart language. Lord, develop a new heart language. I break off any kind of, Lord, device or weapon the enemy has used against your children. Their heartache is very dear to you and the trespassing of the enemy you take personal offense to because God you'll fight on their behalf and I just pray God right now that not only would you seal your love in this decision but it would thrive God to the point of she came in with one purpose she left with a purpose to tell others about how good he is and how he is alive and I pray you would mark us with that and I bless these ones that have stood and others in Jesus name amen come on let's give the Lord a hand clap you be seated thanks so much thanks so much you guys you can be seated Krista hallelujah yes you guys can be seated I mean you can stand if you continue to stand if you want that's totally cool hallelujah Matt when you were leading worship in first service so glad you led second service because this is so profound I, I just felt like God gave me something for you is that okay Matt if you'd stand up come on bro awesome it's so incredible because you got this awesome like fit I like the whole fit right there oh thank you thank you sir but it's funny because it's like in the spirit I saw the Lord measuring you very much like a tailor would measure a person and I felt like the Lord says I'm I'm measuring him for increase I'm measuring him to to put the more on him my sense was in this passage, it talks about he prunes so that you bear more fruit. I don't know, maybe a couple, three years back, there, there had been a bit of a pruning, but the Lord says, now you're going to see the fruit from what the pruning was about. And I feel like the Lord is about to open some new, uh, he's not only measuring for increase, but I feel like <laughs> it, it, it would be weird outside of Groot, right? It's like I saw this shoot of this branch come and shoot beyond you and I felt like the Lord says I'm expanding his reach and I'm expanding the gifting and the acknowledgement of what God has put on you because it's very special Matt and more than anything I, I think of Ezekiel that every time he stepped into the river he was measured for increase and you've got an incredible heritage of what God has done in your life 
but you're just scratching the surface both in kingdom and industry of what God is about to do because the Lord says you've been faithful and faithfulness gets the increase and I see the measuring tape of the Lord about to clothe you with a new mantle, about to clothe you with a new robe of righteousness and favor, favor, favor. So Lord, we thank you and we bless Matt. Thank you. It was so uh, incredible for him to be here and lead worship the way he did and the entire team. And Lord, I thank you, God, that 2024 is going to be this thing where it's like a branch that will shoot forth. And the Bible describes Jesus as a, a, a branch that shot forth. And I saw just this picture of just this shooting forth and expansion and God measuring for increase and the favor and the mantle and the, and the kind of the king priestly advancement that God is doing. But it, it is a green light go season. I love this when I come up to... Uh, intersections and I hate it when I when the opposite when you miss a light you feel like it's going you're going to stop at every single light but there's those moments when you make this light it's green for like several different I just see it bro green for like six and seven different intersections and I mean I'm as I'm saying I'm literally seeing it I'm not even a seer she's a seer but I'm seeing just green 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 and 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 there there may be a there may be some shifts in some relationships some the shift in stuff to shift out but God says you'll know and the ones I shift in there will even be greater increase than the ones that I shift out and so Lord I just bless him in Jesus name man God bless you bro come on Jesus Lord we thank you for your presence in the room Holy Spirit when you're in the room we might be ministering to one person but you're ministering to everyone And so listen for your portion. Listen for what God's saying to you on Resurrection Sunday. What's he declaring over you? What's he saying over you? What's he speaking to your heart? Matt Lancaster. It was cool. You prophesied over Matt, and I got a word for another Matt. Matt and Matt. It's the Matt and Matt Sunday. As I saw you, and I haven't seen you for a while, and I gave you a hug, I begin to hear the Lord say, this is the season where Matt is going, This is the season where Matt is going to experience the love of the Father like never before. And I heard the Lord say, when you were a teenager, he began to go after the area of teaching you that you're first his son. And he went after a father wound in your life as a teenager. He went after it again in your 30s. And I felt like the Lord says he has been going after that area of your heart where he's first your father. And you're learning that the good father isn't just a source of provision, but he's a source of identity. And he's a source of finding out your purpose. And I felt like the Lord, this is bizarre, and we know each other, and sometimes it's challenging to prophesy over people who you know really well, but this is what I got for you. I felt like the Lord says he's going to give you a download to give you an expression for orphans and kids that are in, like, the foster care program that don't know like family and they're just so longing to belong and I felt like the Lord's given you a heart for the kids that have been overlooked and you're a father to many and he's going to give you this beautiful expression where these kids come together and they experience what it is to be seen and loved and valued and there's part of your story That's going to be this beautiful place of redemption of giving these kids what you always wanted. And God brought you an amazing stepfather. I know that. He's restored your father, your biological father. He's restored that relationship. I know that stuff in the natural. But there's parts of your story where you were in places where that was a void in seasons of your life. So you know what it's like to long for the father. And the Lord says, I've given you three sons in the natural, but I'm going to give you like 300 in the spirit. I I just feel like God's going to like multiply your heart as a father. And I just felt like he's going to fill your home with kids. You and Lauren's home is going to be filled with kids that just need to know that they're loved and they're seen. And I cry when I prophesy because I feel God's heart for you. Because it's not just like a nice word. It's like it's it's a promise of God over your life. And I just feel like your life, Matt, is going to change the lives of so many kids that didn't feel seen, didn't feel heard. And didn't, it like, like Sean, like they were just like, God doesn't love me because of what my life looks like. And the Lord is going to use you to rewrite kids' stories. 
He's going to use you to let them know, like, not only does Father see them, but he loves them. And you're going to create this experience. It's like a week-long experience. It's like a two-week experience where kids come and they learn what it is to be loved and a part of a family and to be seen. And I just saw it starting with your kids. I see it starting with, like, your kids' friends and, like, your family being brought together in this really, like, eclectic way, but you take it out to the family, kids that don't have families. And I hope that makes sense. I hope I'm articulating what I feel like. But there's an experience that you're going to put together for kids that don't have family. You're going to show them family. And you're going to bring this. This is interesting. Tech is going to be a part of it. You're going to create an app for connection. I, I know this is unique, but you're going to create an app for fellowship and connection and for friendship and it's something connected with what you're breathing and what you're uh, creating I felt like there's there's a spirit that I feel like Holy Spirit is releasing invention in the room right now so I just received that if you're in the room I just feel like Holy Spirit it, there's a lot of repetition there's a lot of echo in industry right now there's but God's breathing fresh ideas right now in the spirit like fresh apps and fresh technology and fresh songs and fresh sounds and fresh movie ideas like if that applies to you I just feel like God's like there's invention that's being released in the room but that's over you Matt I just feel like the Lord says heaven's invention is being released over you right now and it's for the idea of connection and community and so I just release that over you I just thank you Jesus that Matt is a father to many he's a father to many in the name of Jesus Ooh, love that my goodness, love that. Love this guy and his wife. This whole aspect of coming out of the grave, I felt like God just did a word play in my heart as my, my wife was ministering. Uh, you're a female and there's a thyroid condition and I, you either have graves or borderline graves. It feels like you've heard the term. So I don't know if the doctor said you're there or you're about to be there, but graves. But I feel like it's a thyroid thing, but God says, I'm about to break you out of graves. Who is that female that's had a thyroid condition? I think it's, I think it's Graves or something like that. Uh, but you're a female. You have a thyroid condition. Your energy levels, uh, your emotions, your blood are all being impacted by your thyroid. I, I would just use the term not being regulated. Is that you? Amen. Would you stand up? By any chance, you keep standing because I feel like the Lord's for you. Is there any other female over in this region that is kind of new? Would you stand up? Yes. Can I get someone that's a believer to lay hands on her and someone that will lay hands right here on her? Amen. I love this. My faith. Are you standing too? Awesome. Would someone lay hands on her? Uh, God's coming up out of graves and so are you out of graves. So I just want you to know this is so important is that Jesus' love for you is what compels him to heal. He loves you. And when he calls it out, at least in my heart, the faith level goes through the roof that there's going to be a landing place for the healing. So you guys are laying your hands. You begin to pray. I'm just going to agree with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lifted up these four daughters that have stood that I'm seeing. And Father, we just declare, God, right now in the name of Jesus, they're thyroid. God, they're coming up out of graves as you did. And on that first Easter, even Good Friday, when you exhaled your last, it says many people came out of their graves. And Father, I felt like it was a play on words that, God, we break graves diagnosis, graves disease. We command their thyroid to be regulated. We speak the shalom of heaven. We declare Mark 16 over you that says these signs will follow them that believe will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We declare right now a turning around of your strength, of your emotions, of your blood. And, and one of you in particular is an iron deficiency. We just declare that the iron in your blood comes up to the proper place. And we just declare too, is one of you too having some sleep issues at night where you're, you're struggling to get a full eight hours like good sleep. Does that apply to any of you? I just felt strong on that. You don't have to say that's me if it's not you, but if it is you, just wave. Any of you having problems sleeping? Any of you ladies? I just felt like that's strong. Okay, I mean, we'll pray for anyone, but I was thinking any of these four that are standing, but we'll pray. I love you. You're going to receive this word right now. It felt like something in the area of prayer. So, Father, we just declare God right now. Proverbs 3 says, when we lie down, we will have rest. Our sleep will be sweet. And God, you said, uh, uh, it's a blessing. The, the, the rest of the righteous is the blessing of the Lord. So we just speak blessing. And I, I declare too over the anxiety 
and the things that keeps you a little bit tossing and turning. I feel like it's one of you two. I feel like it's this area. In your sleep at night, we just declare sound sleep. Sleep like a baby, uh, a weaned baby, right? Other babies, amen. But Lord, we pray a weaned baby. They would sleep like that. And we just bless them, Father, right now in the name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. Name in name of Jesus. We're going to just pray. Would everybody stand up with your hand on your heart? I want to pray over this thing real quick because we got a whole deal. We got good weather outside, right? Is sun shining? It might be. We're going to get an announcement. There's some fun things about to take place. But I want to pray over the very thing that God dealt with me on a plane as I was praying for you about strengthening the heart connection, establishing a heart connection, or causing your heart to become more sensitive to his voice. There are a lot of voices out there, gang. There's a lot of voices. And not every voice you listen to brings you to the place you want to be. But when you hear that name, that voice, call your name, turnarounds are imminent. So, Father, we lay our hands on our hearts right now. I pray, God, that you'd begin to connect our hearts to yours. Father, my prayer every day, I spend more time praying this now than ever before. Lord, Holy Spirit, connect me to the Father's heart. Connect me to the Father's love. Connect our hearts, God. We don't want to do what we do out of religious obligation or out of tradition or we've been raised this way. No, we want to do everything out of a passion that if we felt we lost you, we'd cause us to be weeping and crying in Scripture four different times in one chapter because we love like that and love lost hurts like that. And Lord, Mary models something on a whole nother level to us. So we just pray over the deepening of our affections for the Lord and a revelation of how passionate you are for us because that awakens a responding reciprocal passion back towards you. And I pray favor, I pray blessing, I pray safety, an awesome Resurrection Sunday. Bless them, bless their babies, bless them at their jobs. And I just thank you that the, you got up out of the tomb and rose up. So God, we just declare we're going to rise up to and then that old like song, wake me up on the inside, Lord, whatever, I don't know, I'm whatever. Lord, wake us up on the inside in Jesus. I had to squeeze that in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks so much.